Take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter number 5. She was talking about those steps of faith, those action words that are in the Word of God. Someone mentioned earlier, as I was shaking hands at the back, would I talk about uh, Noah some more? Would I uh, talk about what's happening? And uh, the Lord's laid something on my heart maybe for tomorrow night is how to survive Noah days. The Bible says right before the Lord Jesus comes back that you won't just have Noah days. He said that's in the New Testament. It actually says, and they knew not until the flood came and took them away. But the Bible also says that, as it, and Luke talks about, as it was in the days of Lot. So you say, well, Pastor Ralph, I've seen symptoms of Noah days in our culture, in our nation, and in our world. But somebody else said, well, I've seen symptoms and evidence of lot days in our world. But here's what Jesus said. You won't just see Noah days, and you won't just see lot days, but right before the return of the Lord, you'll see Noah's violence, and you'll see the perversion of lot, and it'll come together and provide the most dark days the world has never known. It was bad in Lot's day, but Lot's day didn't have color printing. Lot's day didn't have cable TV. Lot's day didn't have cell phones and downloads. Do you follow me? We're bigger and, and much, much more wicked than Lot ever thought about being. We're bolder. I mean, when, when America loses its moral compass, and we bring drag queens into the public school kindergarten to read stories to our babies. We got a problem, and it begins at the house of God. We've got to understand that, church. There's not going to be deliverance until we are honest with ourselves. Revival's not going to start in the world. It's not going to start in Washington. I wish it would. It's not even going to start in Raleigh. But I tell you where it can start, and that's in your local church. That's in your house. It can start in your heart because it is that mandate from God as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot. And believe it or not, you have lived to see all of that culmination. You've lived to see it come together on your watch. It's not going to happen. It is happening. And so... When I go to Matthew chapter number 5, it, it talks about Jesus seeing the multitude. And, and 30 years ago, there was a tremendous hurricane that uh, hit southern Florida, Hurricane Andrew. And I was preaching a revival, and I came in late at night, and I'm a little bit of a, I love history, but I'm also a little bit of a weather buff. And if I think there's a big storm coming... That's the night you make three sandwiches and get a big piece of chocolate cake and two Pepsis or Cokes, and you watch it all night long. And so I came in from preaching, I was wired, and I made me a couple of sandwiches and, and uh, got me a, a half gallon of Briar's ice cream, and I couldn't get everything to work out just right. And, and I said, I'm going to watch this storm, and I kept watching it, got closer to Florida, and then here's what they started saying out of Miami. We dodged the bullet. They started saying, hey, we've dodged the bullet. We thought this monster Cat 5 was going to hit us, and it's gone south of Miami, and we've dodged the bullet. And I said, well, all the excitement's over, and uh, they're not broadcasting anymore. They're doing starting reruns. And I went to bed. And then I got up the next morning, and I found out that Homestead, Florida was gone. And the reason there were no reports that at the Air Force Base, at over 200 miles an hour, the wind meter actually blew off the Air Force Base. And we began the very birth of Hearts with Hands. And it was there at that storm. I later was visited there in Homestead. They flew me in to work and 
we were doing things with the, we put the tent up. There were no buildings left. So we had the big blue tent then and nine mass poles. It put a roof on a football field, seat 7,000. And we put it up there and they started bringing all the supplies there and all the people came there. And I started driving around and I saw banks with their vault and the bank's gone, the bricks are gone, the concrete's left, and the vault is sitting, and all the buildings around it gone, shopping center gone, school gone. I mean, it's just like you vacuumed the earth off. And as I looked at that power and that might, I, I thought about the things that's in this passage of Scripture. It says the multitudes, and that's where God burdened me because the Bible says also in this New Testament that he looked upon the multitude and he was moved. He, he had compassion for them. And that's when I began to think about what can we do as Christians. And that's when we called everybody, loaded the tent up, got the tractors and trailers, and we went to Florida. Because if you're moved to compassion, you're supposed to get off the couch. Not make another sandwich, but make, get off the couch and go do something. And ladies and gentlemen, just as dramatic and emphatic and powerful as Hurricane Andrew hit our country and wiped out a community and did billions of dollars of damage, ladies and gentlemen, there's a, a hurricane of hell that's ripping across our nation. It's ripping across our land. And we've got to get off the couch, quit being a spectator. We've got to get involved. We've got to get back to praying and, and you've got to get back to going to church and being faithful. You've got to get back to reading your Bible. You've got to get back to saying, I'm going to share my faith. And you've got to get back to praying for your pastor. You say, well, Brother Ralph, you, you don't know how he gets on my nerves. Well, maybe God's got him on your nerve. Huh? We, we need the Lord and we need each other. And pastor... Your enemy's not some guy down the street that doesn't do it just exactly like you do. He said, well, he's got vans and he's knocking on doors and I don't believe in that. Well, then pray for him that his vans don't run out of gas and take up a gas offering for his vans and God will bless you while you don't have any vans. If that's not what divides us. We've got to, you say, well, he didn't go to my college. Well, bless the Lord. At least he went to college. Amen. We need to start praying one for another. We need to, this is not the time to divide and separate and to be critical. This is the time for the family of faith to stand together, to pray together, to work together, and to get off the couch of apathy and say, I'm going to do all I can to salvage my children and my grandchildren. Are you praying for the, the youth group in your church? You say, well, those kids, they mess up everything. Every time they, they do something, there's trash all over the place. And, and I ain't spending any more good church money. I know, I know. You go buy those uh, red-dyed hot dogs that when they boil them in the water, it looks like they boiled them in blood because all the red dye number two runs out of them. And it's made up of pig snouts and tails ground up. You wouldn't buy them a whole beef anything. Buy day old buns and, and then take that down the youth department and say, it's the best God can do. Shame on us. We ought to love God and love our babies and say, we're going to give them the best we possibly can to honor the Lord and make them want to serve the Lord. Go down the kindergarten of first grade and second grade and give them a little old box of crayons in a cigar box and every one of them worn down to nubs and, and it's all broken up and you give them a picture to color and the little kids there holding it up. Is that Italy or is that the Statue of Liberty? Uh, and, and you ran it off on a mimograph machine made in 1949 and it, it's supposed to be the face of Jesus, and the poor baby can't decide what it is, so he just colors the whole page. And, and you, you say, I can't afford to buy cream. What, what? The rock music industry, MTV, VH1, Hollywood, they'll spend 15 or $20 million 
for a five minute video to hook the soul of your baby. And we won't buy a box of crayons to try to keep them in the house of God and to show them that God loves them and that we love them. Shame on us till we have revival. We've got to ask God to draw us together, get our eyes off the foolishness and see that the multitude is perishing. Jesus said, seeing the multitude, he went up to the mountain and when he was set, the disciples came unto him and he opened his mouth and he taught them. And then we go through the Beatitudes, right? All the blessings and he starts going through there. And we get down to verse number 13. Look what he says. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing. I wouldn't say you're good for nothing, but Jesus did. Thank you, Ralph. That's good preaching, Ralph. Amen, Brother Ralph. You keep preaching, buddy. Remind me to bring my amen tape tomorrow night. This is good preaching. You're the salt of the earth. But the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? For it is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. We're supposed to be salt. What is the job of the salt? It's a preservative. It's to keep what's left from going bad. I was sharing with one of the pastors asking me, about the Israel. He hadn't been in four or five years. And I said, one of the most fascinating archaeological discoveries that I have just really enjoyed the last three years is they have found the city of Magdala. It's the actual dock where Peter, James, and John brought in the fish. And they found the pits, the brining pits, where they would put a layer of salt, layer of fish, layer of salt, layer of fish. Because you can't get the fish to Jerusalem. You can't put it on a boat for Rome until... It has been salted. And that's also the same area where the woman with an issue of blood reached out to touch the hem of his garment. And so how did they find this? They went to build a hotel, and when they started the excavation, they found a synagogue. And you know what? What a blessing this is because Jewish scholars and skeptics in the secular world, that's one of the things you've used over and over to say that the New Testament wasn't true because there were no synagogues in Galilee. And you say, well, what about the one at Capernaum? Well, that, that's almost 100 years after Christ, that archaeological discovery there, and that has now been restored and rebuilt to get an idea of a synagogue. And so, but at the time of Christ, 2,000 years ago, they couldn't find any, right? And so they, they were using it to, to say, well, uh, they just fabricated that. J Jesus didn't go to the synagogues. The Jews wouldn't let him in there to teach, and uh, let alone Peter, James, and John. And guess what? They found a synagogue. Not only did they find a synagogue, but they found inside the center of that a stone that was an exact repl replica uh, of the Ark of the Covenant that was in Jerusalem. It's got the menorah drawn on the side of it, etched out in stone, pomegranates, everything from the high priest. They've now taken it from that site. It's now in Jerusalem uh, in, at the Israeli Museum being studied and deciphered. They've made a, a stone replica of it, a 3D image replica. It's now there for people like you and me to go see and study. So, so much interest has uh, mushroomed out of this salt and light location that guess what? They uh, they had to expand the parking, and they were gonna. Well, what about the hotel they were gonna build? Well, a wealthy businessman from Mexico, he said, "I'll write the check. You move the hotel. Let's save the site." He paid for the whole thing, three hundred and some million dollars. Well, I said, "Well, there you go. Not everybody's on food stamps, so." <laughs> And, and, and they moved the hotel and it's now got people in there and, and, and operational. So now so many people are coming, they got to expand the parking lot. So they go across the street and they start grading it out to do the parking lot. And then you hear them start screaming and hollering, come running out. We found more, we found more. Come and look, come and look. Guess what they found? 
across the road. Another synagogue. Now we got two synagogues. Now the Bible is the inerrant, infallible, holy, inspired Word of God. It's your Bible. You can believe it. You can trust it. You can live by it. If you have to, you can die by it. It is the Word of God. And boy, I tell you what, I got so excited. And, and I've looked at this passage over and over, salt and light, salt and light. And so I, I go over there and I begin to study and I ask one of the archaeologists there, and we begin to go down through some things and talking about it. And he begins to tell me about the salting and the brining process. And he said, he said, uh, Mr. Sexton, he said, a lot of people think that when Jesus fed the 5,000, said that he uh, took some big sturgeon or he took a big uh, lake trout and, and he began to cut it and divide it. But he said, this body of water is so unusual because the Sea of Galilee, think about God making this for his son Jesus. That, 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 I get all blessed. I get blessed at my own preaching. Is that all right? Uh, and, and he, listen, God fixed it that tropical fish can live in that water. Because right there at Tiberias, there's warm water springs, bubbles up all the time. That's why the woman with the issue of blood was there. She, you know, she said she'd spend all her money. It was for the sulfur and the drugs that would come out of that. And that's why she was there. It's because she wanted the best doctors. And the best doctors 2,000 years ago were in Galilee at Tiberias. What about that? And so she was there. And this guy was telling me, he said, you got tropical fish? How many of you know about tilapia? Well, they grow, that fish goes in that lake. St. Peter's fish, the bass, it's there. But on the other side of the lake where the Jordan River comes in, the Jordan, it bubbles up out of uh, an artesian spring there at Caesarea Philippi. And all the snow melt and the water off of the top of the mountain, it puts a, a hydraulic pressure and that water bubbles out right there at Caesarea Philippi. Cold, clear water. And the name of the river is Jordan, to go down from the foot of Mount Hermon all the way down to Galilee. And so on that cold water side, there's trout, cold water fish, bass, all in that lake. But the main fish stock of that lake is a little minna, a shad, that is all over that lake. And the, guess when the best time to catch it is? At night. They come up. Why do they come up at night? So the seagulls won't eat them. And the, and the hawks and the falcons that would dive down. So the, all of the, that biomass, it comes up at night to eat. That's why you got your New Testament alive with stories of them being on the Sea of Galilee at night. Now, isn't the Bible coming alive? You begin to understand it. You begin to put it together. And so he's showing me, and he said, actually, Pastor Ralph, he said wheat was for the wealthy people. Barley was for the extremely poor people. And he said we would heat the rocks and get them hot or a piece of metal, and the mother would mix the barley and make like a, 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 a little mix of cornmeal. And she would take a spoon or her finger, and she would take it, and she would put it on the hot rock or on that metal and said it would set a little piece and then the hot would almost puff it and it would make, she, he said it actually wasn't loaves. He said the, the, the word that we have for that loaf it, in the English, it, it would be cracker. It would be a cracker. And I said, now back up here a minute. I'm about to have a Baptist spell. I said, you're telling me he didn't fillet fish and have a fish fry. You're telling me they didn't have big loaves of bread and French bread and they sliced it up. He said, no, sir. I said, what you're telling me is he fed 5,000 people with sardines and crackers. He said, that's exactly right. 5,000 people, sardines and crackers. And when God got through, everybody had something to eat. I love my Bible, don't you? Oh, 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 I can't pass this up. Uh, what side of, of the lake is he on? He's on the Jewish side. He's at Magdala's side. 
And so he feeds them there. That's the Jewish side of the lake. That's why the Roman cities are on the other side of the lake, the ten cities of Rome. That's why Herod built on the other side of the lake because that's the Gentile side. That's why the man of the Gadarenes was on the other side because you can't have pigs on the Jewish side. That's why he was over there. And so he does the 5,000. He feeds them on the Jewish side. And then how many basketfuls do we have left? Twelve. How many tribes of Israel are there? He had a basket for every tribe, for time and for eternity. He would be the bread of life and he would provide for them all the way down to the book of Revelation and he's the coming king and the coming Messiah. Did any of you all get blessed today because they unloaded that red cow from America in Israel for the red heifer? We're getting ready to go somewhere for some of you. Others are going to be at the barbecue, but then you ain't going nowhere. The Lord's coming. And it could, oh, by the way, did Jesus feed some on the other side of the lake? He did, didn't he? How many did he feed? 4,000. Does anybody remember how many baskets he had left over on that side? Seven, one for each continent and one for the seven churches out of the book of Revelation. God fed the Gentile world on one side. God fed the Jewish world on the other side. He said, I'm Alpha, O, and Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. I am he that was dead and I'm alive forevermore. I'm the coming king. I'm the deliverer. I'm the Messiah. I am all in all king of kings and Lord of lords and the God of provision and the God of the future of this world. So Jesus comes to Magnola, chapter 5, Matthew. He is there. And he says something strange that doesn't make a bit of sense to us. You're the salt and the light of the world. And he walks down on that dock and he's teaching and preaching to the masses and to the disciples. And the reason he keeps going to the water is it, it fractures the sound and reflects it back so that many more people can hear it. It's acoustical chamber that's made there. And so he's teaching. And when he said that you are salt, all those fish that are brought in to be shipped, they have to be salted. So they put them in the brine basins. And there they are brined out, and that way they can go feed Jerusalem. They can go feed Jericho. They can go feed the Lebanese, they can go feed all around the known world, even to Rome, Italy itself. And he said to them, where is he standing? He's on the dock. Here's a brining pit, a brining pit, a brining pit. Mm. Glory to God. Jesus got salt all over his sandals. He's cranking and cracking that salt. He's walking around in it. He's saying, hey, boys, let me tell you something. We can't feed anybody till we got the salt, till we got it preserved. They would take care of the food. And he said, you need to know that your job for the people and for the culture and the society. And remember, he's got salt all over his sandals. He's saying, you are the salt of the world. Well, then what else did he say? Go down that next verse. Watch this. Not only are we supposed to be the salt, verse 14. Ye are the what? Light of the world. And a city that is set on a hill cannot be what? Well, if you're standing on that same platform there at Magdala, right here is the highest part coming up out of the northern part of the lake, and there's a city on the hill to this day. And that softened. It's right there. It was there at the time of Christ. If you're fishing at night and you don't have any Energizer Bunny Rabbit batteries, if you don't have any kerosene lanterns, if you don't have any generators with electricity, how do you find the dock? How do you find your way home? There's only one navigational point on that whole lake, 
and that's that city that's built up on the hill. And he said, if you wanted to, you couldn't hide it. It's too high. It's too big. Got too many people, too many lights. Said, you got to see it. It's the navigational point for all of the men that fish on Galilee. And Jesus said, as he's standing with salt in his sandals, and he looks at the disciples and the people, and he said, you are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. You are like this city on the hill. And you are to be in the darkest day, the darkest hour, with the most pollution and with the most unbelievable form of wickedness on planet earth. We're to stay clean. We're to stay pure. We're to still love the Lord. We're still to point people to the Lamb of God. And we're to be faithful for the sake of our children and our grandchildren. Ye are the salt of the earth. Now, let me help you with something. If I take a piece of chicken, which I love, if I take a piece of chicken and I put salt on it, then I flavor the chicken and it is something that I would enjoy and I have the flavor that is balanced out in that chicken by the salt that I've applied, right? Do you like to have a fresh, warm tomato out of the garden? and bring it in the house, and it's about that big, and slice it real thick, and t take some, I, I hope you're not eating that brown healthy bread. <laughs> that will kill you in a heartbeat. Because there's no joy in that, and joy depresses you, and it pushes you off the cliff. You need some white bunny bread. Soft and squishy. A jar of Duke's mayonnaise. Lay a quarter inch on this side and a quarter inch on that side and lay that big steak of the made in the middle, salt and pepper it and enjoy. Right? Nothing any better. Right out of the garden. Still warm, right? What flavor is that tomato? Salt. If I take uh, rice and uh, I make perlo rice, I'm a bachelor now, so I'm learning how to cook. And, uh, and there's a lot of disaster stories, but we're not going to cover them. But uh, I have bought new pots, let's put it that way. Uh, but, but here's what you can do. You can make a beef roast, right, and put it in the crock pot. And then one of the things you've got to do, if you want it to come out right, you've got to put some salt, right, on that potato, carrot, onion, and beef mixture. And then it's so good, right? But let me help you with something. The salt, look what it does. The salt flavors, let me, let me read this to you. You're the salt of the earth. If the salt has lost its what? Savor, all right? Then look what it says. He said, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for what? Nothing. Nothing. You, it can't salt. It won't help. It won't do any good. What does the salt do? It flavors the meal. It makes it possible to enjoy it. If you take, the salt is now going to flavor. It's going to uh, Enhance the flavor and keep it so you can eat it. But if I take that same piece of chicken and I take a, a half a handful or a fourth a cup, a half a cup of salt, and I lay it on the table, and I take that chicken and I lay it on top of that salt, and then I take that another half a cup of salt and I pour it on the table and I, I lay that tomato on top of that salt. And then I take another half a cup of salt and I put that roast on top of it. I don't go back here in a few minutes and pick up that salt under that chicken and say, mmm, that tastes just like chicken. You know why? Because it's supposed to taste like salt. It doesn't absorb, watch it, what it's around. Mmm. 
It touches and preserves while it's around. You better quit absorbing this world. You better quit absorbing what's on the cable and what's on the TV. Same thing with the tomato. It's not gonna season or flavor that salt. That's tomato flavored salt. That's roast beef flavored salt. No, the preservative value of the salt is that it keeps it from being destroyed and it provides flavor. That's what this verse is about. But you don't have the outside object providing flavor to the salt. The salt stays salt. Salt is salty. It's good stuff. And you got to have it. And, and what God's saying here in the world, he, in his word, he's saying, don't you let the world take your savor. Don't let, him, don't let the world try to change what you are. You, you know what's killing our churches? We've gotten caught up in all this fad religion all across America and, and we're, we're trading out old-time religion for showtime religion, and we're trying to let the salt be flavored by the world. We don't need another light show at the house of God. We don't need another band at the house of God. Your kids don't need more religious entertainment. They need to see the power of God demonstrated at the house of God on Sunday morning when God's man reads the word of God. That's the only hope we've got is revival for this generation. Now, this whole evidence that we presented here in the Word of God is that we've got to be a people of prayer. All of this is keeping us clean, keeping us pure. And, and then it says, Let your light shine, verse 16, before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, I, I told you the other night, I know that you don't have... This problem down here in Stanley County and uh, Albemarle, and Randolph County, they, I, I know you don't. But in the mountains, it's a different culture, different world. We actually have Christians that gossip. I know you don't have them down here. <laughs> but in the mountains, we got them. I mean, they do. We actually have Christians that will be critical in church of things in the holy house of God. I know you don't have that here. But it's a, it's a mission field up there in the mountains. I'm telling you. It's tough. And, and, and you know what else can happen? They get all wired up over stuff you wouldn't even think they get wired up over. I mean, they get fuzzed up. Well, I mean, we had a big day at Trinity. I mean, I'd worked for seven or eight months getting in dignitaries, senators, congressmen, mayor, ev Everybody going to preach the gospel. They need it too. So we had a big day. And, and you know what happened? I, I'm, I'm up on the platform and the mayor of our city is sitting on this front row on the first level. And the vice mayor and the city manager, a congressman and one of the aides for the senator, it's front row, all dignitaries. And one of my ladies who always sits in that chair She walks in church, got her bag, got her King James Bible. He looked up some kind of, hey, how are you? I'm the mayor. I don't care who you are, you're in my chair. I'm trying to get out of my chair. I'm paralyzed with fear. I'm running off the platform. And the poor mayor, she made him move. <laughs> and I said, Mayor, I apologize. He said, don't worry about it. He said, well, anything this church needs, you won't get it. Uh, so <laughs> he, he, said, he said, I've never been so humiliated, and then he died laughing. <laughs> he said, I deal with people every day, too. I said, thank the Lord, amen. <laughs> But you know what we do? We, we get upset over stuff. We had a mountain church that God blessed them. One of the precious saints of God died, went on to heaven, and left a family farm and put part of it in a ministry and put part of it in 
to their local church. They didn't have any children, and so they wanted to take their financial blessing. They planned their estate that the gospel would be preached after they were gone. And so they never had bathrooms in the church. That little mountain church still had two paths, one to the boys' outhouse, one to the girls. And in her will, she said, there's enough money to build bathrooms in our church, drill a well, bring in the water, and we'll have indoor plumbing. And guess what? They did that. And they did all the work. Now the sheetrock, the paint's done, and they're getting ready to set the commodes in all these new bathrooms. And one side said, oh, I, I don't think we ought to buy those blue ones. Uh, these people said we ought to have blue commodes. And said, ain't no sense in wasting God's money. We've waited all these years to get bathroom. Let's buy white ones. And they split the church over the color of a commode. White and blue. Can you imagine going to the marriage supper of the Lamb and then to the judgment seat of Christ and saying, God, I know you're proud of me. I split that church over them commodes. I wasn't going to let them buy those blue ones. That's what we do. And we wonder why there's no revival and why our kids don't want to go to church. I, I'm teasing now. I found out it wasn't just in the mountains. I was preaching in Alabama a few years ago, and I went to this church, and I thought something strange was going on. The, on one side of the church, I, shingles are brown. I drive around on the other side of the church to unload my book table. Shingles are black. I drove back around and make sure I wasn't crazy. <laughs> I don't, that, that's definitely brown. <laughs> yeah, that's black. And I, I what's going on? I, I finally got with somebody after service one night. And they said, Brother Ralph, said, we about split this church. Said, God blessed us and we had to put a roof on. And one side wanted brown and one side wanted black. And it looked like we were going to split the church, divide the people, and said they formed a committee on the color of the shingles. They didn't form a committee to pray for revival. They didn't form a committee for soul winning and knocking on doors. They didn't form a committee for getting a bus route and getting kids to church. No, they formed a committee on shingles. And the solution was, we'll put one side black and one side brown. So everybody that drives by knows there's no unity in this church at all. That we've run the Holy Ghost off and then we wonder why there's no revival. That's where we're living. And we wonder about salt and light. You see, this is what we've got to have. We've got to be real. And he said... When you begin to look about these things, ladies and gentlemen, that God would deal with us as a people of faith, that we would say, God, I'm not going to play church. We're running out of time. I'm not going to play revival. We're running out of time. God, I want to be used by you. I want to be real salt. I want to be real light. I don't want the world flavoring me. I want to flavor the world. You've got to see the urgency of the hour. Now, Monday night, the Lord allowed us to bring the message on revival in the church. And on Tuesday night, over 500 people in the altar that night as we talked about revival in the family, as we stood together in unity for God to touch us, right? Last night, revival in ourselves, that our children, our grandchildren, our teenagers in particular, they can see that Amnon had a friend. He had the influence of the world. And every one of us, no matter what age you are, there's going to be somebody try to influence you away from God. It's amazing when somebody sins, they want somebody to go with them. Isn't that amazing? Especially young adults and teenagers. They don't want to, they don't want to go alone. And like I told you, all the surveys we've done with teens over the years, Brother Greg and the teen meetings, and down at the camp, even this summer in Georgia, 
the, the very evidence of the fact, the power of an influence is they'll tell you, we, get, we do surveys a lot of time with no name on it. We don't want to know. We just want to tell us what you're thinking, what you're experiencing. First cigarette, my friend gave it to me. My first beer, a friend gave it to me. My first marijuana cigarette, my friend or my brother, sometimes the older brother, older sister. You know why? They don't want to get in trouble alone. They don't want to sin alone. And that Amnon friend concept is in the house of God today. So tonight, the challenge has been, can you get your prayer life back and be salt? Can you get your prayer life back and be light? Can anybody see your light? Or does your wick need to be trimmed from the things of this world? Has your salt lost its savor? Does the Holy Spirit of God need to wash your salt and make it clean so it can be tasted and felt again? Have you lost your testimony in the world with family and with co-workers and friends at school? We need the Holy Spirit. I told you last night about working and buying my first car and how that I worshiped that car and all that I was doing. And I was trying to hide my other life from my dad and my mom. I'd go to church on Sunday to make them happy. And then on Monday, I'd do what I want to do. Get out of work, get out of school. And I told you about my friend that was killed in as he committed suicide in that car. And the last person he talked to was a hypocrite named Ralph on his way to eternity. And you know, I can remember coming home in the wee hours of the morning. Aaron, I can remember I'd come home and I'd cut the engine off on that little Chevy, kick it in neutral. I'd catch up ahead of steam up the top of Bavard Road, kick it in neutral, cut the engine off, and I could coast all the way down that next block and into my driveway, turn in. No engine, no muffler, no glass packs, no sound. Get out, shut the door like this, and then walk up on the porch, put the key in, unlock it, tiptoe in. Sometimes take your shoes off if you had your boots on. And walk in quietly. Head upstairs to my bedroom. I'd hear something. But Jimmy sent it. I thought, sounds like something's in the basement. We had a basement door. The steps going down. We had a coal-fed stoker. And an old steam boiler that provided heat for the house. Red clay, no concrete but it had so many tons of coal on it over the decades, it was hard as concrete, and it had the oil of the coal that had made it smooth. And I gently opened that door and looked in there. There's a little old 40-watt light bulb over that stoker, laying down by that coal-fed stoker. It was my dad stretched out on that red clay. 1.30 in the morning. <laughs> Hands like that up to God. God, I don't know where Ralph is. I don't know where he's been all night. But God, <laughs> that's not my boy. That's your boy. God, for he's born, we laid hands on his mother's womb and said, God, we give this child to you before he ever gets here. That's not my boy. That's your boy, God. You know where he is. God, don't let him outrun grace. Don't let him outrun mercy. God, get a hold of my boy. I'd close that door back. I'd try to slip upstairs and go to bed. But you can't get away from that. Mamas and daddies that believe the word of God and they begin to pray. I wonder when's the last time your house heard you calling on God and saying, God, please have mercy on my family. Have mercy on my daughter. Have mercy on my son. Have mercy on my best friend. God, save my husband. God, save my wife. 
Where's the brokenness of the church? Where's the tears of the New Testament church? We're supposed to have salt and light. God got a hold of me. I was, got right with the Lord at age 27. I was a young businessman. I was in Chicago, Illinois at a vending machine conference. I owned an Asheville vending company. And uh, God got a hold of me. He broke my heart. I cried all night, got under conviction, couldn't sleep. Musette and I were in the hotel room. She said, what's wrong with you? I said, I got to get right with God. I'm miserable. We had money. We had new cars, motorcycle. If we wanted to watch a football game on college game day, we'd go to follow Alabama. We'd go to Tennessee, wherever we wanted to go. Money wasn't a problem. Do what we wanted to do. New toys parked in the, I had a Kawasaki 750 that I rode. And, and, and you know, it, toys everywhere. That empty in here. <laughs> Nothing working in there. Boy, God broke me there in Chicago in that hotel. Let me see eternity real. I prayed all night in that bathroom. I didn't need anybody to talk to me. I didn't need a preacher. I didn't need my mom and dad. I didn't need my wife. I knew what was wrong with me. I was running from God. I got so low and he got so high, I felt like I could walk under the, the bathroom door with the door closed because the power of God was so real. And God began to tell me that you not only can you get right and you can get back in faith and fellowship, but you can live right, Ralph, if you'll surrender it all, if you'll quit to holding on to the world, if you'll quit trying to, to flavor the salt and let the salt work on you instead of you working on the salt, I'll change you, boy, and I'll make a preacher out of you. And, and God began to break me. God got a hold of me. Next morning, my eyes were all swollen red. Music said, what, what's wrong with you? I said, I'm messed up, but it's a good messed up. And she said, well, I'm going to go with our friends. We're going downtown. And said, they're going to go to lunch. Said, you know where they like to eat? Said, we'll meet you at the restaurant. I said, yeah. Yeah, I need to wash my face. I need to get a hold of my emotions. And uh, I went in the bathroom, washed my face. And I said, man, that feels good. Let me watch some TV. And I turned the TV on. And uh, just as soon as the TV came on, here came another wave. I'm bawling. I can't even see the TV. And I, I cut the TV off, and I said, maybe I need a Coke. I, I just go down to the vending machine, get me a Coke. 10 o'clock in the morning now, I take a little ice bucket and take some change. I'm in a big old hotel, right? Multiple stories. Vending centers on each floor. Who ever heard in your life of a line being at a Coke machine at 10 o'clock in the morning. Unless God sandbagged you and ambushed you. I go down there, got my little bucket in my arm, got my change, and I'm standing there, and there's a line at the Coke machine. And I'm standing there going... <laughs> the guy looks around. Oh, they got the Coke machine. The guy, the second guy said, hey, buddy, it'll be all right. You just trust God. <laughs> I'm standing there crying. This guy walks by, pats me on the back. Me standing in line, pats me on the back, said, give it to Jesus, son. Give it to Jesus. That's ambush. You, I don't play fire. I get my coat, my eyes, I go to the room, I, I can try to get it together to go to lunch. And finally I call a cab and I go downtown to meet them for lunch. And I get out of the cab and there's another wave. Boy, God's going to forgive you. You'll surrender. You got to turn loose. Quit trying to flavor the world with your flesh and the world flavoring your salt. And you get back in business and let the salt do the work. Let the light be the light. And so I come inside and I'm wiping tears. Hey, how y'all doing? <laughs> They're all sitting at the table, big restaurant, round table, linen napkins and tablecloths, one of those three-fork places. 
You ever figure that out? Three fork places. And, and, and I, I'm, they're sitting there, and I sit down. And they said, uh, Ralph, uh, we've already ordered. And the waitress walked up. She took my order. And uh, they said, we're glad you're here. Musette said you had a, a different kind of night. And I said, yes, I did. I did. There was some <clears throat> accounting going on in my world. I was trying to adjust some things. And I'm trying to act like nothing's wrong. Everything's cool. About that time, Holy Ghost said, yeah, tell them what really happened. I went, but I got right with God. Oh, I'm sorry, crying again. I couldn't help it. A big rest. Of, I grabbed one of them big old napkins up and covered my face. And I looked around for an exit. And there was some big double doors. And I, I just went right through them and got the, leaned up against the wall. And I'm in there crying. Oh, God, thank you for mercy. Thank you for grace. God, I'll do what you want me to do. Lord, thank you for another chance. Fill me with the Holy Ghost, God. I'd rather die than not have your power. Oh, God, get a hold of me. And I thought I heard something. I'm in the kitchen. That place was filled with all these big, tall, white hats. It looked like I was at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Everybody in big old white outfits and chef's hat. And right in front of me was a big eight-burner gas stove. And they had a big old pot cooking. And the lady there, a big black lady, and, and she had one of those boat paddle stirrers, right? And I pulled that napkin down and looked. And she's there on the end with big eyes. And she went, mm, mm, mm. Pour it on him, Jesus. Pour it on him, Jesus. And I said, oh, no, I can't take no more. I surrender. I came home, surrendered, and I preached my first message the next Sunday morning. And God saved 76 people in that one service. You never know what God's going to do. We've got to surrender. It's not me. It's not Brother Greg. It's the power of God we need. What's going to reach your children? Power of God. What's going to save your marriage? Power of God. What's going to rescue your church? Pastor, it's going to be the power of God. What's going to get the choir? It's when they sing with the power of God. Did you know there's something powerful about music? God invented music. I wish I had a little bit of time to talk to you about music. But music opens the door to worship. And if we worship right in music, you know, people get saved while we're singing. People get right with God while we're singing. God can heal the folks while we're singing because we're worshiping. We're praising. He loves that. Stand with me, would you? God spoke to you tonight. Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Do you want to see the power of God in your home, your life? We're just going to open the old-fashioned altar. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, you're not sure you're saved, would this be a sweet night to be a believer? Preachers, why don't you lead the way? Deacons, Sunday school teachers, let's ask God for fresh oil. Mama and Daddy, won't we come pray for our babies?